famous antidote of history that I believe is true. It's reputed to be true. It's when Cortez was talking with Montezuma after he had conquered the Aztecs and they had hamstrung the best of their warriors. He was asked, Montezuma was asked, don't you want to convert to Christianity and go to heaven? And he asked, will Spaniards be there? And he said, yes. He said, then I don't want to go. <laughs> well, you know, as humorous as that is, it speaks a lot of truth. Because the church, from about the, fifth, the beginning of the 5th century on, got to meddling in things they never should have done. And it was because of an erroneous prophetic view, an erroneous interpretation of prophecy. And this was systematized, this erroneous view was systematized by Augustine and written down in a book called The City of God. And even though Augustine was straight on justification by faith, he was certainly off on the prophetic view of the church. And the church at large began to implement this prophetic view. They said you can't take prophecy literally, you can only take it allegorically. Good men started out with this view. And you know what? The, the view itself, the system it created, corrupted the men. And that's why this system is nothing new. It gave us the crusades, the inquisitions, the constant anti-Semitism that broke out within the organized church. Even when the reformers cast off the darkness of a thousand years of covering up the scripture with allegory and they recovered justification by faith, they still accepted the theory of Augustine that you could only interpret prophecy allegorically. Martin Luther, in his latter days, wrote very anti-Semitic statements in his writings, so much so that did you know that in Mein Kampf, written by Adolf Hitler, he quoted Martin Luther as part of his justification for doing away with the Jews. So what I'm talking about and what I have been talking about in this series is something very serious because a wrong prophetic view can create great evil and I think history shows it. The church did not bring in the kingdom of God on earth by being in control of governments. And they once, the church was once in control. And I'm talking about the organized church at large now. The church at one time was in, in dominion over most of the governments of the world at one point. It didn't bring in righteousness. It brought in all kinds of evil. Now, the new movement is taking this without looking at the lessons of history and is trying to reintroduce it through the charismatic movement. And along with it comes the, the mark of Satan. And that's the only way I know to tell you. There is a mark of Satan in certain areas and you can always tell it. You know what that mark is? It's as clear as the nose on somebody's face. The mark of Satan is a hatred of the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's always there. You can always tell it. It's a curse. So let's look with renewed interest at what Paul says here in Romans chapter 9. Let's read the first five verses again. I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying my conscience bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. This was the Apostle Paul, who is an Israelite, expressing his grief over his people. And the, the subject of nine, chapters 9, 10, and 11 has to do only with these people. The main theme is the people of Israel. He goes on, for I could wish that I myself were a curse, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, 
my kinsmen according to the flesh. Who are Israelites? To whom belongs the adoption as sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises? Whose are the fathers and from whom is the Messiah according to the flesh who is God over all? And notice the corrected translation. Who is God over all? Blessed forever. Amen. That's the way that should be translated. Absolutely, in the Greek, it's clear. It's saying that Christ, the Messiah, came through these people physically, and he is God over all. Blessed forever. Now, if you are new here this morning and you haven't caught up on this series, there are tapes on previous messages on this. There are several already on chapter 9. So you'll have to, I'll have to refer you to the tapes to catch up. But we have arrived at tracing the nine advantages of the Israelites. And we have talked about all of those up to the covenants and I've gone through three of the unconditional covenants already. We're going to take the fourth unconditional covenant, which is listed here as one of the great advantages of the Israelites. The covenants were given to them. The Abrahamic covenant guaranteed that they would be a special people forever. Called them forth as a special people forever. God made unconditional promises to them that they would always be a special, distinct people people. The Palestinian covenant guaranteed them a specific large piece of real estate forever. They've never possessed that yet, but they will. The Davidic covenant, which we've already studied, the Davidic covenant guaranteed that they would have a world kingdom with a king who would be none other than the Son of God, the Messiah. All right, those are three of the four unconditional covenants. Now, we're taking up this morning the fourth one. The fourth unconditional covenant made to these people is called the New Covenant. The New Covenant. Please turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 31. Remember how to become an instant Bible scholar. Turn to the front of your Bible, find the table of contents and get page numbers. Believe me, when I call out Obadiah or Zephaniah, you're going to be fumbling. Or Haggai. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke. I want us to put this back into perspective of history. When did Jeremiah write? Approximately. Jeremiah prophesied and wrote approximately in the early 7th century BC, around 680 BC in that area. Okay? Now he makes this prophecy that God is going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Now, why would God make a new covenant with the house of Israel? Verse 32 tells us why. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. When was that? Hmm? When did he make that covenant? Exodus. When they came out of Egypt in the Exodus under Moses, okay? 
Now that would have been around 1450 B.C. Get the perspective. We've got hundreds of years there. Now what covenant did God make with Israel in the Exodus? Hmm? Those who went with me to Israel should certainly know that. We went to where it was made. The Mosaic Covenant. God made the Mosaic Covenant with Israel around 1450 B.C. at Sinai, Mount Sinai. Now I said there are four unconditional covenants made to Israel. There are actually five covenants that are made with them. Only one was conditional. Now this is very important. Only one covenant made with the people of Israel was conditional. All the rest were unconditional. Now what do we mean by unconditional? We mean that God made a covenant with the people of Israel that did not depend upon their faithfulness. It depended only upon God's faithfulness to his word. God predicted that they would fail from the beginning. So when they did fail, they failed to believe God. They went into apostasy. They went astray. God even predicted they would reject the Messiah when he came. Read Isaiah chapter 53. God predicts all through there that they would fail to believe in the Messiah when he came. And yet, nevertheless, see, God was caught by surprise by nothing. He knew they would not believe him. He knew they would reject the Messiah. And yet he still made these unconditional covenants with them. Now that's very important when you get confronted, and sooner or later you will be confronted with this new dominion theology, which says that because Israel rejected the Messiah, they're rejected and cursed forever. The only way that they can now have any relationship with God now and forever is to become part of the church. Well, that's true now. They must believe and become part of the church today. But the scripture says there's a time coming when the church will not be the focus of God's dealing and Israel will be Israel again. So we must constantly keep in mind that the unconditional covenants did not depend on Israel's faithfulness, only God's faithfulness to his word. The one conditional covenant, the Mosaic covenant, did depend upon their faithfulness to keep the, the covenant. So when they accepted the Mosaic covenant and they failed to keep the Mosaic covenant, the issue is their failure to keep the Mosaic covenant, did it disannul the other covenants? Did it? Can you prove it? Now, when you come up against some of these fair-haired boys that are in this new movement, believe me, they've got scriptures cleverly pulled out of its context that'll confound you. Believe me. Let me show you how to prove it. First of all, in verse 32, notice, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke. Okay, here in 680 B.C., God already recognizes they've broken the covenant of Moses. Right? Okay? Now, look with me, hold your place, and look with me at Galatians chapter 3. Verse 17. Galatians chapter 3. Verse 17. What I'm saying is this, Galatians 3, 17. The law, which came 430 years later, later than what? the giving of the Abrahamic covenant. 430 years later, 
does not, what? Invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise. But God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. Okay, now here, this is very, very important. You see, the Mosaic Covenant, which was added 430 years after the giving of the unconditional Abrahamic Covenant and the Palestinian Covenant, that failure under the Mosaic Covenant could not invalidate Covenants that were made by God by an oath. Have you got the point? Okay, it's tremendously important. Here it says in black and white, their failure cannot nullify a promise previously ratified by God. All right, now back to Jeremiah chapter 31. In verse 32, where he says, My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declared the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I want you to begin to note and underline every time God says, I will. That's always the key to unconditional covenants. When God says, I will, and he doesn't, he doesn't say anywhere in the context, if you will, it's unconditional. All right? He says, but this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Now, who's he making the covenant with? The house of Israel. Nowhere... In the scripture, is any other people called the house of Israel? Only the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay? The church is never called the house of Israel. Never. We're called children of Abraham, and we are children of Abraham by faith, but we're not the house of Israel. Okay, we'll clarify that more in future times. All right, now let's go on. This is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will, notice, I will. I will put my law within them and on their heart I will write it and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, and I will remember no more. Okay? What a covenant. Huh? The new covenant is wonderful. It certainly isn't like that covenant made with the Israelites at Sinai, is it? Where it says, if you do this, 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 and this, then you'll be blessed. If you don't do this and this and this, then you'll be cursed. And the curses are terrifying that are listed. And every one of those curses that were predicted have been fulfilled on Israel for failure. But nevertheless, it says God would make this new covenant with them and that it includes, let's look at the most beautiful part of this, verse 33 again, I will put my law within them and on their heart I will write it. Now, how is that possible? How can God put his laws in our hearts and write them in our hearts? The Holy Spirit. Now, this covenant then could not be be implemented in the old covenant times could it why not every believer had the Holy Spirit only a few selected believers had the Holy Spirit and that on a temporary conditional basis 
That's why David prayed, take not thy Holy Spirit from me when he was confessing his sins in Psalm 51. This covenant couldn't even begin to be implemented until the Holy Spirit was given to every believer. Okay? All right, then it goes on. It says, not only that, but look at, uh, he says, I will be their God and they shall be my people. Then in verse 34, they shall not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. Now we're talking about something very unusual. It's saying that every Israelite on earth would know God from the least of them to the greatest of them. What are we talking about here? What period of time is he prophetically referring to? He has to be referring to the millennium, the time when only believers start out populating this earth. The time after Zechariah speaks, where in Zechariah it says that God will cause two-thirds of the living Israelites to perish, but the third will be saved, and he said they will be purified as silver. Zechariah chapter 13, verses 8 through 10 tells us. And he said, I will bring the third through the fire, and I will refine them as silver, and they will say, the Lord is my God, and I will say, they are my people. So it's talking about the believing remnant that survives the tribulation here. And it says all of them will know the Lord from the least to the greatest. And many passages about the millennium talk about everyone knowing the Lord. It says the knowledge of the Lord shall cover the earth as the sea covers the seashore. So this is referring to its ultimate fulfillment in the millennium. Now let's read on. It says, For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. This is also talking about a kind of forgiveness that was not possible in the Old Testament. You know why? Because in the Old Testament times, under the Old Covenant, Jesus had not come yet. He had not paid for all sins, past, present, and future. So every year there was this remembrance on the Day of Atonement of offering animal sacrifice. Every year they would have to take the blood of a lamb into the Holy of Holies of the temple. The priest would have to sprinkle it on the golden mercy seat of the ark to cover the symbols of man's sin, the broken tablets of the law, Aaron's rod that budded in the pot of manna, that was inside of the ark. Those were symbols of man's sin. But that had to be done once a year. And so it was evident that God had not forgotten their sins. They were merely covered. But when Jesus Christ went to the cross, what did he do? Well, John the Baptist announced what he would do. John 1, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 29, John the Baptist, as he looked at Jesus, said, Behold, the Lamb of God that what? Takes away the sin of the world. He wouldn't just cover it for a year like on the Day of Atonement. He would take it away as a barrier between men and God. And all those who believe what he did, it's no longer a barrier. The sins are forgotten. So this is talking about conditions that could only be present after Jesus had completely atoned for the sins of mankind and after the Holy Spirit was poured out to every believer. But it's also talking about its ultimate fulfillment being in the millennium when everyone will know God. Every person who's alive will know God from the least to the greatest. All right, now I want to read on because this is the, these are ramifications of the new covenant in verses 35 through 40. I want you to prayerfully meditate on this as we read it. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea that its waves roars. The Lord of hosts is his name. 
If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out below, then I will also cast off all the offspring of Israel for all they have done declares the Lord. Now, you know, young man down in Orange County is frequently on TBN. Very articulate young minister. He came to me one night and he said, Israel is the church. The physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are finished. If they... the God's not doing his Jewish thing and now he's doing his Gentile thing and then he's going to go back and do his Jewish thing again. He said, the only plan and program God's got going today is the church. If any physical descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob ever wants to be saved, he's got to become part of the church. The church is going to conquer the world. The church is going to bring the world into dominion. And I said, that's interesting. Because as I recall, the sun came up this morning and the moon came out tonight. And he said, what in the world are you talking about? And I said, I'm talking about a promise God made. He said, if those things cease, then Israel will cease being a nation and the offspring of Israel will be rejected forever. But as long as those things continue, they will not be rejected, right? And I want you to notice at the end of verse 37. He says, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out below. Now, one of the things I really enjoyed about being down in the Sinai Peninsula is that you're far away from lights and things like that. And you look up and you can see stars like, like when I was a kid, before pollution. <laughs> I'm giving you a secret, man. That was back in the horse and buggy days. But you look up and you see those stars and, you know, there's no way to count them all. Some thought in the days of Abraham they could count them all. And then came the telescopes. And then they thought they could count them all. And then came the radio telescopes. And, you know, now they're beginning to say, what we see is only a fraction of what's there. There's no way to count the stars, ever. There is no way for man to ever understand all of the laws that God put into operation by the power of his word to hold the earth together, the foundations of it, how it was created. Man will never know. It's blatant arrogance for man to think he can discover how all things began. We can accept by faith what God says and verify it by known science, but we can't understand the workings of God because we're not God. And what he is saying here is, you can't understand that, but if you ever could, then I will cast off Israel. In other words, if you can get omniscience, then I'll throw Israel away. And I want you to notice the final little signature. For he will cast all of the offspring of, he will also cast off all the offspring of Israel. Why? For all that they have done. Now what's he saying here? He's saying he's aware of all they've done. He's aware of what they would do. Nothing takes God by surprise. And he says, in spite of all they do, I will not cast them off. That's the whole direction of this, isn't it? It's in black and white. Who can miss it? Except one who is determined to go into error. One who is determined to have something new so he can be the spreader of this new truth. It's not new. It's exhumed from the pit of its failure in the past history. almost said it. All right, verse 38. 
Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when the city shall be rebuilt for the Lord from the tower of Hananel to the corner gate. And the measuring line shall go out farther, straight ahead to the hill Gerev. Then it will turn to Goa. And the whole valley of the dead bodies and of the ashes and of all the fields and as far as the brook Kidron. Now where, what's he talking about here? Verse 38. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when the city shall be rebuilt for the Lord from the tower of Hananel to the corner gate. And the measuring line shall go out farther, straight ahead to the hill Gerev. Then it will turn to Goa. And the whole valley of the dead bodies and of the ashes and of all the fields and as far as the brook Kidron. Now where, what's he talking about here? He's talking about rebuilding physical, literal Jerusalem. The brook Kidron, we crossed it several times when we were over in Israel to go to the Mount of Olives from the city. The gates, we know where all of them are. And he says the day is coming when he's going to rebuild this and the dead bodies. What's he talking about dead bodies? The dead bodies of all of those who are going to be killed in that great war when the Lord comes back. Read the final part of Zephaniah chapter 3. Read Zechariah chapters 12 through 14. It tells you all about that great war that will take place. And God says there's going to be that great war. There's going to be bodies piled up in that valley as predicted. It's called the Valley of Jehoshaphat in other prophecies. And it says that it's then that the Lord is going to rebuild this. Now, let me give you, and this is all in your study guide, but I'll just go over them. You don't have a study guide, by the way. My faithful man, Ted McReynolds, will see that you get one next week. <laughs> Poor Ted. Okay. By the way, take these scriptures down. Ezekiel chapters 30, chapter 36, verses 24 through 28, also traces the new covenant. And also chapter 37, verse 14. Now here are 11 features of the new covenant. Number one, it is an unconditional grace covenant resting on God's I wills. Note how frequently I will is used in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. And also in Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 60 through 62, which talks about this same covenant. Ezekiel 16. All of this is in your study guide, so if you have it, you'll be safe. Number two, it is therefore an everlasting covenant. The, the new covenant, when it's implemented, is an everlasting covenant. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 35 through 37. We just read that. Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 26. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 2. All these show that it's an everlasting covenant. Number three. It includes the promise of a new heart and a new mind. Jeremiah 31, verse 33. Four. It promises the restoration of the nation of Israel to favor and blessing. Hosea chapter 2, verses 19 through 20. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 9. Okay, number five. It provides for a permanent forgiveness of sin. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 34. Article 6. Permanent universal indwelling of the Spirit for all believers. Jeremiah 31, verse 33, and Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 27. Feature number seven. It gives a universal teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 34, and in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 9. Feature number eight. National Israel must be restored to its land 
for this covenant to be fully implement, implemented, national Israel must be restored to its land for this to be fully implemented. Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 41. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 8. And very important, Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 25 through 27. Zechariah chapter 14, verses 9 through 11. And Amos chapter 9, verses 13 through 15. Feature number nine. God's true temple must be rebuilt in Jerusalem for this to be implemented fully. Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 26 and 27. Feature number 10. There will be global peace and war will cease when this covenant is fully in force. Hosea chapter 2, verse 18. It has the same characteristics as the millennium, which argues for it being fulfilled at the same time. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4. Feature number 11. The blood of Jesus, the Messiah, is the foundation for all the blessings of the new covenant. So those are the important features of the new covenant. Now all these four unconditional covenants were made only with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants. As we'll see, temporal blessings were all for all those descendants, but the eternal blessings were only for the descendants who believed in God's promise. Now, that's very important. We'll have to unravel that later. But you see, certain temporal blessings were promised to the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whether they were faithful or unfaithful. But the eternal blessings promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are only for the descendants who believe the promises. All right? The Lord Jesus Christ was the special, ultimate descendant of Abraham. Now, here we go into something that is very important. How can we, Gentiles today, be part of these covenants? They were made only to Israel. Only to the physical descendants of Israel. So how can we, Gentiles, be part of these covenants? Turn with me to Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 through 18. Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 through 18. Brethren, I speak in terms of human relations, even though it is only a man's covenant. Yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is, Christ. What I'm saying is this, the law which came 430 years later does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise, but God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. All right, now here is the most important feature of this passage. The spiritual eternal promises of, made to Abraham were made ultimately to one of his descendants. Who was that? The Messiah, Jesus. So that means the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, who wanted to be in the eternal blessings, had to believe in this one who was to inherit all of the promises, that is the Messiah. So the Israelite who was going to be in God's eternal blessing had to believe in this coming Messiah. 
because the possessor of all of the eternal blessings of this covenant really ultimately resides in Jesus Christ. Now, how is it that you and I then are partakers of this? When we believe in Jesus Christ, there is a miracle that takes place instantly. Actually, there are many miracles, but there's one that's a miracle of miracles. You don't know about it until later you read it and you believe it. But something happens instantaneously. It's done by God. The moment you have believing faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior. At that instant, the Holy Spirit takes us and baptizes us into an eternal union with Christ. We become a member of his body, of his flesh, and of his bone. Ephesians 5.30 We become one with him. Now, once we become one with Christ, what happens? We become what? Co-heirs with him, don't we? Ephesians talks about that all the time. So how are we participators in the covenants made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's descendants? By being joined to Christ so that all of the promises that were made to him become ours. And that's how we are made to be spiritual sons of Abraham. We're made to be spiritual descendants of Abraham because we're put into union with Jesus Christ. But that does not take away the fact that they were made to the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who also believe. Now, we're going to get into this in more detail later, but let me just point you to something very quickly. What part of the new covenant is now in force? You know, the new covenant was made to the house of Israel. Its ultimate fulfillment will be when all living people have the knowledge of God from the least to the greatest. Its ultimate fulfillment will be when Jerusalem is restored, when the earth is restored to its former glory. But part of the new covenant is in force right now. How can we tell what part is in force? Hold your place here and turn with me to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 8. I'm sorry, chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. For by one offering, he, Christ, has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. You know what that word sanctified means, hagiadzo? It means to be set apart as God's possession. It's the same word, same root, that means to be holy or set apart in Christ. It's the same root from which we get the word saint. So all of us who have been sanctified means that we have been set apart and joined to into a living, eternal, inseparable union with Jesus Christ. So it says, for by one offering, he has perfected for all times those who are sanctified that is you've been set apart in him now for those who have been set apart in him by faith what happens verse 15 the holy spirit also bears witness to us for after saying quote this is the covenant that i will make with them after those days says the lord i will put my laws upon upon their hearts and upon their mind i will write them That's Jeremiah 31, verse 33. He then says, now he quotes from the end of verse 34. He then says, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. That tells us what part of the new covenant is now in force. 
Part of it was set into order when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. Part of it was put into order when Christ said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabbathani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At that point, he was made sin in your place and in my place. God judged him in your place and in my place. And then, after he was fully judged for your sins and mine, he shouted out the Greek word, Tetelesti, which means paid in full. It's translated in John 19, 30, it is finished. But it literally meant paid in full. Same words found on receipts that have been discovered all over the ancient world. He meant that everything necessary to pay for your sins and mine had already been paid. And when he did that, he took sin out of the way as a barrier. That's why God can say their lawless deeds I remember no more. When we believe in Jesus Christ, we're forgiven past, present, and future sins. Now we can knowingly sin as a Christian and get out of fellowship with God, but we can't get out of a relationship with God any more than when you have a child and it disappoints you, it does something wrong, you don't disown your child, you discipline it, you don't disown it. So this is what's in force, but the full, the total fulfillment of this is yet to come. The ultimate fulfillment of this will be when the knowledge of God shall cover the earth as the sand covers the seashore. When the house of Israel is restored to its place, God promised. When they possess the land that God promised them. When the king sits on David's throne and rules over them. When Jesus Christ comes back to this sin-cursed earth and he sets up God's kingdom. Man can't do it. Only God can. And in the Old Testament times, this is what God said to the Israelite. The Israelite had certain temporal blessings, but one of the supreme examples of Israel came to Jesus when he was here on earth. He was a man who was a distinct Pharisee, and Jesus gave him the compliment. He said, you are the teacher of Israel, which Jesus recognized him as being the outstanding teacher of Israel. His name was Nicodemus. This was Old Covenant. It's not New Covenant. This was Old Covenant time. The law was still in force. And you know what Jesus said? Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He cannot understand the kingdom of God, Jesus told him. You know why? Because even a physical descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if he's going to enter the eternal blessings of the covenant, had to believe in the one that God predicted. In your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And that seed was Jesus. You know... The thing that thrills me is that no matter what error, no matter what false teaching comes along, if you stick with the book, you can steer your way through it. You got to know the book. We live in a time when God said there would be doctrines of demons and false teaching that would be introduced. A time when he said people would come working signs and wonders in the power of Satan, but there'll be signs and wonders, he said. And he said, even the elect will be fooled. So it's a time when we really need to take the time to go through and learn the Word of God. It's a time also that when maybe we've been going to church, maybe we've just visited, but it's a time when we need to know that you're part of this wonderful company that God can say their sins and lawless deeds I will remember no more.
Does God remember your sin? He does if you've never accepted Jesus Christ. So I challenge you right now. If you're unsure where you stand, and maybe all of this has been sort of a mystery to you, if you're unsure where, where you stand with the Lord, then I challenge you right now, invite Jesus Christ to come into your life and accept the gift of pardon that he offers. I'm going to ask the singers to come up at this time, and while they're coming up, I'm just going to ask you to pray if you're not sure and invite Jesus Christ to come into your life if you don't know where you stand with God. Let us pray. Everyone bow your head and let us pray. Right now, if you don't know that Jesus Christ is in your heart, you don't know that you're forgiven, then just simply say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Please come into my life and forgive me. I confess, I can't be good enough for you to accept. So right now, I receive your pardon. Thank you for coming in as you promised. Thank you for eternal life. Thank you that you will give me the strength and the desire to be what God wants me to be. Did you pray that? If you did, then on the authority of the Word of God, which cannot lie, I say you have eternal life. And what God gave, no one can take away.